students. All right, we're recording. Them. Okay, so like I was telling, this is Misal Juarez. And, you know, I talked to them a little bit about you. He wrote a book called My Spoken Word Wife, which is amazing. And I, look, I'm an editor that I don't like rhyming poems, but I love his work. And so he's also working on another manuscript called My Dream Catcher in the Rye, which he has sent to me. So we're going to start with Misael. I had already talked to you briefly, but Gary, who doesn't know Misael, uh, Misael Juarez is a Zapotec, um, you know, indigenous. And he, I'm going to meet you out, Gary, because I think I'm getting feedback. But basically, uh, Misael has overcome a lot of struggles and he's just an amazing person in general. So he's going to read for about five or 10 minutes and then Gary's going to speak. Uh, Gary is the author of Harsh Reality, as many of you know, but he is also an amazing researcher. So I'm hoping that he'll hone in on that. So they're going to read for about five, 10 minutes a piece and then we're going to open a question and answers. All right, Misa, are you ready? Yes, I am ready. All right. Well, this is a poem about the Los Angeles Sutsu riots from 1940. You know the Sutsu riots? Yeah, Sutsu riots. Tell them a little bit about it because they may not know about the Sutsu riots. And I'm sure Gary probably doesn't know about the Sutsu riots either. All right, Los Angeles, 1943, during the time of World War II, there was a, 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 a group of young men who would dress up in slacks and creased up pants and brim hats and they had all these khaki suits and they had long hair and they had chains hanging out from their belts and they were persecuted for dressing up like this. It was because um at the time uh there was there was a prevention from the fabric that they were wearing their zoots their zoot suits, uh, which is a suit that was um very popular in, in the nineteen forties. Um it was it was it was said that you couldn't wear this type of fabric, so but they wore it anyways, and they had long hair and whoopty whoop. But it's a little bit suspect because there's a lot of racism to go along with that because Mexican Americans were targeted for for being um uh this they were rolling too cool I guess, and they were um a situation happened when the sailors. Uh, they were going to World War II, were partying in Los Angeles at the time. They went and they hung out and, and at the docks and they went through downtown Los Angeles and they beat up these men. So, and it started these riots because um, civilian groups, cops and other people joined the their forces to attack these groups. And so this is a poem to honor about that. Along the way, as they were being attacked, they also attacked black people, Asian American people, which were the Filipinos and the Chinese, and um, et cetera. And anybody got caught slipping. So this is a poem that talks about that. Are you guys ready? Yeah, they're Hello? ready. I'm sorry, I muted the mic up. They're ready. Go ahead. All right, all right. Who's calling the police to stop the madness? News articles are filled with racist passion persecuting the suit suitors who were poor, but they came uniting the streets during war. I asked the ancestors for permission to ride. Shout out to the big bad Chumash and Tongba tribe. Those are the original peoples of LA. What you know about Broadway name Eternidad? Cause LA was founded by Mexicans and blacks. My spoken word wife sits and listens to my rhyme, taking her, taking her to a moment when young men shine during the Sleepy Lagoon murder trial signs where every LA body was rooted in time. Cops arrested Pachucos for rolling too cool because brown dudes were targets for wearing zoot suits. News reporters defamed Chicano young men. Sailors watched going with a passion to hate them. The Navy couldn't stand how Pachucos broke rules. A mob, a mob of white civilians stormed to ridicule, teaming up with racist cops to catch them by foot. The Pachucos riots were set up by white troops. Pachucos were town heroes and city villains. Cops hated the stylish ways of these Mexicans, but Christoph Chicano vets always knew laughter because these young suit suitors were wordplay masters. Trials and tribulations made them wiser. Pachuco riots on streets spread like a wildfire. The servicemen came by the cross to lose control. Pachucos respected traditions to live bold, wearing their shiny double stitch shoes on Broadway, coming from the barrio to sh shine and dance and parley. In nightclubs dressed in silk and wool wearing brim hats, wooing the pretty the pretty women in slacks. 
Thousands of civilians and servicemen form mobs, beating pachucos with weapons to leave them robbed, stripping off their clothes and shoes while raping women, black and Asian folk catching blows of racism, brown, black, and yellow beaten throughout old LA. It took a truce to unite them to find a way. They became street allies and came up with a plan, arming up to protect themselves to fight the white man. A neighborhood uprising called them to be free. Racist white cops driving folks to insanity. While the Jews persecuted for their own culture, Pachucos enlisted to be combat soldiers, calling them animals, yet they too fought Nazis, repping for every kid in the barrio and street. The pieces of the story don't always add up. The talk about fighting over fashion and such. Some trace gang banging back to the Tutsu rights, only wanting to protect ourselves from hate groups. The Pachuco Street victory downplayed with lies, but I honor that city's ancestors with pride. Who's calling the police to stop the madness? News articles are filled with racist passion, but Pachuco's placed their best bet on unity, ending the streetwise riots with a victory. Yes. Hello. Are we? Oh, I'm mute. I muted myself. Uh, Lord have mercy, y'all. Let's give him some snaps. That was beautiful. Yeah. That poem gets Our... better and better the more you read it. Oh, great, great, great. Uh, I got another one. What would you like to hear, Hesu? Anything Bro, particular? You know, you know, I love the anchor poem, my spoken word wife. But oh, I'll oh, happily yeah, listen yeah, to that you, one again. Can you explain to them what an anchor poem is? Because I don't think they know what that is. Tell them what the anchor poem is. The anchor poem is a poem that's about uh, me uh, dwelling with uh, psychosis and hallucinations. And I I came to be with, with this uh, phenomenon, this psyche phenomenon, where I'm totally um, detached from reality. And I and I dwell a lot in hallucinations because I am considered schizophrenic to the Western uh, world. But um, I came to know poetry as a as a survival guide, and because of that, I have called my muses my wife because they spend a lot of time with me, and the, I have the best clarity when I am writing and not when I am speaking my truth. So these poems came out out of hallucinations. But so I call it my wife. Poem, the anchor poem is like the central theme of the collection. Hence the title, My Spoken Word Wife, and what he just explained to you, right? So this is one of my favorite pieces. I love them all, but this is one of my favorite. All right, thank you, brother. All right, here it goes. She's a beautiful brown petite woman, bringing out my humor and wit full of wisdom. I'm speaking about the poetic body of goddess. She rules my heart and brings out loving comments. I'm inspired by her soulful, loving nature, pleasing her with words that spell out raw danger. And writing about her bright world is easy. Every word filled with light bringing her home to me. Yet sometimes the world spins like an oldie record, and she's a chola singing through stormy weather. I never surrender to her imperfection. I'm surrendering, I'm surrendering to her will as a blessing. I penetrate the world with an infinite look. She purposely looks like a dork with a book. While I'm planting a tree in every neighborhood, making it up to nature for the paper she took. Her world's like a still, soft, and sweet melody. And like a detective, I solve mystery. I'm on the edge of discovering my real gifts, seeing my destiny without the crucifix. I hold her hand and I get more respect, forever feeling like this book is my mistress. I see her pain was never meant to be so, but like the river, she is owning her true flow. She's the best hand I ever played. So place your best bet, playing my hand like every star depends on it. Her smoke protects me from evil grins, blowing smokes as I flip the wild aces to win. Living on the edge makes me dangerous as they give me a war for making bold statements. I celebrate her style at LA Open Mics with this dedication to my spoken word wife. Beautiful, beautiful. Want to hear one more? Yeah, sure. Yes. All right. Hey, how about one about class issues? Because I love how you talk about politics in your poetry, which is something maybe we can talk about today. Okay, class issues. That's right. Let's go to class issues. Let's see here. Okay, I got it. Bom uh, talk bombs and poets. Oh, I love this one. 
They persecute the street poet to cause her harm. She's dangerous to the system with words like bombs. Surviving the matrix with a sweet freedom song, inspiring the youth to write that which brings the dawn. I knew that she was vital to social changes, but they wanted her dead under such a strange mess. She became the walking dead until I showed up, blasting evildoers with streetwise music cuts, letting them know that we aren't going nowhere unless we go first class to where no one has dared. She's enticing like thunderstorms with blue lightning. Her poetry hits our hearts, leaving her shining. Her words are aimed at ideas to explode them all with graffiti sentiments like a city wall. Her poetry and gun battle make common sense. Her words are bombs exploding dangerous concepts. When the dusty scenes are clear, she's leading the field. Our opponents suffer because she's breaking the deal. She's against challenging the evil status quo, blasting the troops with truth and a red star symbol. The pen is the social justice weapon that heals, killing pretentious ideas by keeping it real. I'm launching hot verses with like Molotov cocktails, burning the scene with intoxicating females. War doesn't make profit till it destroys something, but protecting the poor makes us dream better scenes. I too can bomb the system with booming bass sound while getting paid to have the town, the town folk dance around. Women take the lit stage and speak their grievances, rhyming precisely for the exploited seamstress. It don't take a college degree to make demands when you make the crowd roar with a microphone stand. Nice. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Misael. So now we're yeah. going to hear from um, from Gary, who was having trouble getting on. I thought you forgot, bro, but I'm so glad you came. Uh, I'm going to spotlight him so you can see who he is. So Gary, like I told oh. you, he's a, he's a prolific writer, but one of the things I admire about Gary, like when he researches, he researches. You know, I think I told you that Gary's constructing his third sword mm. from scratch, right? I mean, that's deep, you know? Um, all right, well, Gary, why yes. don't you go ahead and read from our Harsh Reality or wherever you want to share. Oh, my goodness. I'll, I'll go and find it. Um, <laughs> I'm, <reading, laughs> I'm writing the the sequel to it right now. Um, what? And Damn, dude, you're, you're prolific. No, it's... Uh, <laughs> I've had to go back again and again and again because it needs to be it's the most difficult thing i've ever written uh, and i'm going to hang on a bit no I'm worries but i will it. say that I, I admire gary and misa both because they write full time like they have taken the plunge you know and it's not easy because it's e even with uh authors that have traditional contracts through like um del rey or you know the major publishers they still have full-time jobs, you know what I mean? And so, but Gary and Misael, uh, right full-time. This is what they do, you know? And so maybe we can ask them about that because it takes courage. I, I wouldn't do it even if I had a contract because I got kids and I need benefits, but it's a struggle, you know? Um, I think it. No worries, man. I can keep uh, talking. Just let me know when you're ready. No, no. I've got it. I Well, actually, I thought I had it, but I seem to have the cover. I'll get there in a bit. Um, no worries. When yeah, uh, when stuff came back from um, your publisher the, was amazing. The publisher, yeah, we that there was a bit of a problem. So I'll just go for that. What part would you like me to read? I'm open. I think it's so beautiful. Oh, they will talk about the deep influence I had over the art in the book. It's gonna <laughs> no. Go ahead, brother. Right. Uh, I'm going to randomly choose a place halfway. Oh, that's the, probably not a good idea, but I'll do it anyway. Um, Why don't you start from no. the beginning? I will, actually. Yeah, because it's the most absurd beginning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, seriously. If, if you look at modern fashions in writing, you have... Uh, all sort of strictures and rules and demandments made on you as a writer. When in reality, uh, the harsh reality is that you look after the reader, uh, which unfortunately I didn't do with this book. So I had to rewrite, well, all of it, but in particular the opening, 
because what particularly these days you don't expect the reader to listen to a long complicated uh, opening of backstory so there was none of that what they got instead was a lot of a suicidal girl who's a bit of a wimp that is your main character the reader is given a complete wimp as a main, main character following with that you're introduced as a reader to an environment which is more or less inexplicable in inexplicable because the poor girl doesn't understand what's going on and then as a reader you're dumped into a totally weird situation which again the girl doesn't understand and because it's first person she can't explain it to you and then she has to meet several other characters that's no way to treat a reader <laughs> <laughs> sorry really... i'm sorry this is hilarious <laughs> so don't as do this writer... <laughs> yes don't do any of those um, <laughs> uh, as a writer to make that work you have to literally work your pants off it's to make something simple for the reader when the situation is actually very complicated at the beginning of a story um oof it, uh, yeah well i got there because i fortunately had readers who were able to give me good strong feedback these were um editors from uh, sort of colleague editors from previous publishing houses and they finally said oh yes you've nailed it anyone could get through that <laughs> however um yeah uh, if you think you're going to writing don't do that and certainly don't do what i'm doing in the second book because it's even worse <laughs> sorry has you do go on <laughs> no, it's lovely. Go ahead. <laughs> You're just making me laugh a lot. I needed to laugh. Well, thanks. <laughs> uh, well, I am writing the, uh, the sequel to that, but it's also the sequel to what Clarendon House has, has called the collected writings of Gary Bond. And they all sort of converge in a theme which i think is my life's work however i nice. see sorry do you want to cut in there no no i just said nice i'm sorry i'm gonna mute out you go ahead. you take it away brother sorry <laughs> okay uh so uh you want me to read the opening of oh dear goodness well, i'll do my best here it's uh, it's a very well. <laughs> if anyone, any of the um, students want to throw things at, they they the have started reading the book, so this is going to be a real treat for them. I've opened the wrong one. Sorry, I will try again. Got it. Sorry, is early for you guys but for me it's been a very very long day hang on okay here we go Tari welcomes the numbing cold her thin limbs growing lifeless sleep beckons at last one from which she'll never wake she hadn't expected to die so soon or so easily but assumed death would come in the lethal and unexplored desert to which she's headed. Sprawled over the boxes and barrels over which she'd thrown herself three hours before, the retaining force, 
locking cargo to the transport lifter pulls her against angles of hard resin and rough wood. Tori is held as she landed, unable to move. Solid rock flashes past. Behind her lies the life she's fleeing, bullying and humiliation. No more struggling to stay awake, terrified of attacks with sticks, glue, needles, or whatever new torture the dominant girls in her company home invent. Ahead lies a legend. The trenches, the source of dramatic media headlines, the most dangerous place on earth, and an entire shift dead in a single day. The flicking, flickering viridian light illuminating the moving cave fails. The passing rock slows. A burst of fierce light smells leather, sweat, sewage, warmth flows over Tori. Anonymous voices, calls and commands echo from distant walls. Hey, Sharp, we've got a recruit. Lynn, switch the lifter off so she can move. Get the cable. Tori peers through a gap in her long black hair. A thin woman with bouncing step walks towards her. The woman tucks long scarlet and gold curls into a pony ponytail. Her red overalls rustle as she squats by the lifter and clicks a button on its side. The lifter, a flat white rectangle piled with cargo, sinks as the retaining field shuts down. Too exhausted and stiff to stop herself, Tori tumbles to the gritty floor. Boxes crash down around her. She chokes in billowing dust. Someone steps over her, pulls the cable from the lifter, pushes it into a console socket and says, All right, comms on. Why are all the headsets tangled? Tori shifts as grit digs into her face. She thinks, I'm really here. In the trenches, I can hardly feel my arms and legs. I'm free. Not, not long now. She tries to rise, but something hard digs in, into the heel of her palm. Shifting her hand, she sees the object gleaming in dust, distributed by falling boxes, a silver disc embossed with pictures and words. Studying it to, to divert her mind from the agony of returning circulation, thinks it's metal. Why do they leave it just lying around? Is there that much here? Two dollar and Tori pushes it into a pocket of her tattered trousers. Rolls study people gathering. Hang on. Got a hey Gary, you're breaking up a bit. There. Yeah, oh, right. yeah, you're you're breaking up a bit though. That was beautiful, okay. and we'll have space to uh to read a bit more. I, we didn't catch like okay. the last bit, but um, let me. No, I want to pin both. Give me a moment. Hold on a second. Oh, right, I can do this. Sorry, y'all. Add to spotlight. Oh, que la fregada. You know what? This is just a speaker view, which is what it's on. I can do this. I do this for a living. All right. Uh, um, Misa, <laughs> why don't you go ahead and unmute, brother, so the students can ask you questions. Why isn't it letting me... Oh, what ifs. All right. So what you're not seeing is my students that are here, and I'm sorry the camera angles here suck, but um, you you both have, have, have different styles of writing, and I know I started with, you know, um, both Misael and Gary are uh, writers that write full-time. And I don't know if you can maybe speak to that. What your experience has been as a full-time writer and maybe why you made that choice. And maybe students, as they're answering this, ask questions of them. Uh, you're welcome to have some snacks. We got water and apples and whatnot in the back and chips. Not the kind of chips you eat. We're talking about like potato crisps. All right, who wants to start? So why did you choose to be a full-time writer? 
and what has that experience been like? Is that to both of us? Yes, to both of you. This is going to be both of you. Okay. Uh, who wants to go first? Go ahead, man. Yeah. Oh, thank, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, okay. Why did I want to go full time? Uh, because I had worked out what I needed to do with my life and I had something to say and feedback to people because I'd gone through a whole horde of different lifestyles uh, from volunteering with mountain rescue and what have you through to being a nurse uh, being a uh, psychotherapist uh but fundamentally being an artist um running projects the most spe spectacular of which was working with hunter gatherers and learning about the way they think which then reflected all of these things reflected back on the way that I think, and I have something I would like to feed back to people, a sort of uh, distillation of all of that. Gary, uh, Gary, I, I have a quick question, because I, I didn't was, realize that you, you had been with Hunter Gathers. Where, where did you do that? Uh, most of it was done with researchers from... Uh, universities uh cambridge uk uh and cambridge <laughs> what is known as the publisher uh in in the us and either working with them face to face with the people involved or alternatively talking with them in the UK and trying to make correlations and turn how this is so difficult to say actually turn no, no, how no. they take turn how they think into ways that we can interpret because it's um it's like a it's like an alien world, or rather, we are the aliens in their world. Uh, it's such a different way to think. Uh, that's amazing. And it. here, I thought I thought you were like in the bush or somewhere, you know, like. You know, but that's cool, Misa. And what about you, brother? What what? And first of all, listen, y'all. Let's all give Misa a huge round of applause for coming on the fly and doing his sister a favor. Well, yes. Thank you, Misa. You gotta unmute, brother. And you clean up real fast, by the way. I like how you did your hair. <laughs> yeah. Um. Why write? Why? Why are you right? Just, just. Well, um, I struggle. I struggle for a long time with psychosis. Um, when you hear things that other people don't hear, when you see things that other people don't see, and it was driving me mad, it was getting me in trouble. It was getting me in situations that um, created a bad character defect on me. So I, I struggled with that, you know, so I had to find, there's a time in where I, I that I reached that nobody wanted to hear me out mm -hmm. simply because I was such a turmoil. I was such a basket case and everybody didn't want to listen to me, including people that said that they were all for healing communities and, and everybody belongs. Even those people wrote me off. So what to do then? Um, 
I would write and write and write. I would try to share my writing, but no one would listen. I got rejected a lot. And they, there came a time when people were saying, we don't want your writing. Stop writing poems to us. And and then what, what to do then? Um, I was struggling so much because all that energy in my head or in my heart was combusting. It was creating um, a, such an effect that was eating me up and consuming me. Mm. Like, I feel like I needed an outlet, like I needed a place to stay. Um, once Hesu uh, and I linked up, she didn't reject me. She and she really complimented my poetry, and she um, gave me a deal to to write. So I started really working on these poems, like revising. You know, it's so like we would go back and forth, and it was like it was a never ending job. But during the whole time that we were doing that, um, I felt uh, disinflated. Like I, it felt, it felt, it felt like I was, um, um, just what's the word like inflamado? You know, like inflamado. You were yeah. inflamed, entusiasmado, como como un como un ardor. Like like, like incandescent. Uh, I, yeah, I felt like and I was ooh, loaded, man, but like incandescent, I, bro. But like after I started writing and doing all that stuff, and people started hearing the. The now, because it's different. If you're published, people look at you different. They'll listen to you different. But That's if right. you're not, they, they, they. It's it's a weird thing, you know. Like you're saying the same thing, but now it's published. Now it's under a press. Now it's under, and 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 it captivates people, and it gives you a little bit more credibility. Mm. So, by going through that that those those um uh processes. I was able to reach an audience and people were able to listen to me and they were asking me questions and I could relay the energy that I have gathered in my psychosis to uh, a public audience. And and that's why I really enjoy writing simply because it's almost like a spiritual practice for me where I do it every day. I try to say things that... um. And I've gotten better at it, you know, like I feel like my next book is a lot more uh, uh, concentrated and more, I'm saying more things that because I had now have the confidence and I have the support and things like that to say these messages for working class people. Mm -hmm. And I feel like um, I've been able to to uh, improve my language skills to create uh, such an effect that it creates a lot of um, wonderful sentiments for people about working class people, social justice, and people that are going through bizarre and strange experiences such as I am. And I know yes. that when I run into a schizophrenic or uh, run into somebody experiencing psychosis or mental illness, I know exactly what's going on. Like, I feel like I know exactly what's going on in your head. You know, like, oh, I could see it. There's, there's so many complexities to it, but I feel like writing has definitely allowed me to get momentum and, and gather my, my energy to describe uh, the human um, the human condition and, and, and time and space. So thank you for that question, Hansel. No, that's beautiful. And man... Damn, you answered that so well. The, the thing about Misa, too, is that he... Uh, let me mute you up, brother, just because... Or just real quick, because one of us is bouncing. May I interject at some point? Uh, yeah, yeah. The thing that I, that I appreciate about Misa is now that he feels more confident, like I tell you all, you have to write regularly. You have to read a lot. And so Misa writes that, from what I've seen on social media, at least three hours a day, right? Now I got the manuscript. Now what's going to happen is I'll edit it in the assistant editor who is really my co-editor, is going to look at it. His name is Daniel Brooks. He's also a phenomenal poet. Um, and so we're going to go through it. But the 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 rhymes are beautiful. He spends a lot of time working on his I ams. Whether he does it naturally or not, I don't know. But it's like da 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 da. They're there. And and it's just gorgeous. And I'm telling you, I am not a lover of rhyming poetry, but I love his poems because it's seamless. I don't even see the rhyme. You know what I'm saying? It's just beautiful. Go ahead, Gary. 
Oh, what was I going to say? <laughs> so I was so listening to you, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, You've had a long day, come, brother. We forgive you. It'll, yes, it'll come back to me. Um, carry on. All right. Okay. I'm sorry. You can unmute me, Sida. I was just, uh, we were just, there's an echo. Okay. Does anybody else have a question for our esteemed authors? Use this time. Use this time. Hi, my name is Isa. I'm a student in Hess's creative writing class. Um, and I guess this applies to both, but how do you feel that um, your upbringing influences not just your style of writing, but also the types of characters that you write in your story? Do you feel more compelled to write um, characters in your stories that are more reflective of you, or do you feel more compelled to write stories about other types of lifestyles? Did you all get that question and I'm going to meet up because there's a little bit of an echo. So she wants to know if your upbringing and lifestyle has influenced how you create your characters or do you create characters well, using your imagination? And, and I'm mute on because I know we're bouncing off each other. It must be because we work together all the time, bro. Yes. Um, well, you want me to answer that question right now? Which of whoever course. wants to take it first. Uh, Gary, I, you want to go first? Or me said? Yeah, I'll go first. Um, All right. What I, I definitely want to write about about what they call the ghetto, the barrio, the suburban. Um, I definitely spent my time with rich people, wealthy people from way up there, and I noticed that it's, it's it was very um, shocking to 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 see and and and. And be a person from this place, knowing that this is how a certain level of people think and think about us and, and just how they see how they inspire each other. I felt like, you know what, I learned a little thing from a learn thing or two about it, but I definitely feel like um I definitely must write my characters out of the body. I have to guide them through that. I have to guide them through the world. I have to guide. It's like I'm guiding myself through. Like, uh, it's like I'm mapping my consciousness, and um, and I feel like you know, like you are as good as you speak. You're as good as you write, and the better you write, the better you are off. Because I heard that one time from a professor. He said you will always be as good as you speak. And um, so going back to that question, you must definitely try and try to center your consciousness. And in such a format that you can guide the people who are like you into situations that are better in in terms of prosperity and abundance and and creativity and generating community. So I definitely write towards uh, young people if that's what you're asking me. But definitely, thank you for your question, Gary. Um. I would like to go back to this idea of uh, that has been previously mentioned about working class and an idea that poetry should only be or could be aimed only at them. Um, on, the other, on one hand, we have working class class well beyond that we have impoverished people who literally watch their children die because there isn't food the water or what have you around and on the other extreme we have people who are so incredibly wealthy they choose how many meters their son or daughter require for their yacht at one million dollars a meter. And <laughs> the point is both of these people are physically and 
spiritually and psychically, as Jung put it, trapped in the same doctrine. The rich person and the poor suffering, if you like, person are trapped in a trap of mental activity that to be rich is better and to be poor is worse and my writing is about getting above that and saying well this is part of the big picture if we're mature how are we going to go ahead with that uh, I, I hope that was an answer to your question. Not quite, brother. The question, although I appreciate that analysis, because I think you're right. There's something to be said for hegemony, how people see the world and how entrenched they are in it. And in the United States in particular, because we are a purely capitalist country. Well, not purely, but the the people associate upward they want to be rich. They want to be, you know, the superstar. They want to be the streamer that gets a lot of followers, right? It's very rare that people associate down. So there's that psychology. Um, but what what she asked was, when you shape your characters, do you shape them around people you know, or do you just base them off your imagination? <laughs> right. Okay. I missed that. Uh, I was always obviously on another tack. I don't build my characters on anything other than what I can understand and work with. Now, with my own experience, that would be me and all the people I've uh, nursed or uh, lifted off mountains or just live with that's all I have to go on that makes sense and in particular didn't you read a piece by Gary a short piece of fiction I showed you that okay so they read that short piece of fiction that you offered about that person who was handicapped that you um, equated to an angel which was very powerful. They read that piece, you know, and, and that was somebody you saw in real life, right? Yes. Yeah. I, that's a beautiful, when you know the context of it, the story carries more significance. I think it's beautiful. All right. Another question from the audience, please. All right. Woo. I think Alexis will first, then you, Miha, then you, Miha. Hello, my name is Alexis. I'm a student of Dr. Estrada. My question is, knowing what you know now, what advice would you give yourself um, as a writer or even to like a younger adult version of yourself? All right. So what advice would you give your younger self or your younger writer self? Well, um, I'll, say I'll wait about good. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll go first. Um, I would give myself the advice that uh, to listen, listen. To, to my thoughts um there are times where i'll be driving or i'm just walking or doing like housework or uh working somewhere and i I'm, automatically i get this great thought and and i um at the time i was barely training myself to write uh carry a little notebook around uh with me and and write these thoughts down but i feel like there's a these thoughts they don't sleep they don't rest and 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 if you don't download them yourself like from your mind into your writing utensils you're not gonna you're not gonna capture you miss the opportunity your thoughts are opportunities you know and and you have great ideas already already a lot of you are are are, are going through uh, a phase where you're generating ideas and you don't know where they're coming from and and you have these ideas just write them down and that would take you to the next stage of development um the writing process uh, developing your ideas and I'll, I there's times I'll be sitting in front of my professor and they'll be talking about one thing 
And all of a sudden, I'll be thinking about animals. I'll be thinking about like what they mean to us in the world. And I will write the, a little side note on my notes and and just captivate that. It's like I'm I'm and and that's and that's how you gotta look at your thoughts. Your thoughts are are beings that are coming to you. They're coming from a source, from an inspiration, from your muses. They're 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 talking to you. You may have not a relationship with your muses where you can tell them, you know what, from five to nine PM, that's when I want you to talk to me because that's when I can write. Now your muses are always engaging you and they're always um trying to like elevate you and see and make you see one thing clear. And I wish I would have known that as a young man because uh, thoughts are gifts. These are our gifts to us. These are these things that feed us and house us and thoughts can um free up uh, people from slavery and things like that. So remember your thoughts are, 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 are your salvation too. So thank you for asking that question. That was a beautiful answer. That's probably the most, okay, you're just hitting it today, brother. Um, can I give you my piece of advice? I wish I had told myself this. All right. So I grew up in the barrio and in a very misogynist culture, but also in like the ideas were interpolated in my head that I had to find a boyfriend, right? And it was a very cisgender way of seeing the world. I wish I had spent more time reading and writing than I did chasing tail because I wasted a lot of time through my doctorate. And I, I couldn't find a date to save my life. I dated a few guys here and there. I didn't get married till I was 38. In that time span, I could have gotten two degrees. You know what I'm saying? So it's good. Romance is great. But what really endures is the knowledge and the art you create. Because that's going to be there with you for the long term as long as you're healthy. Now that I'm leveled up, now I'm catching up. You know? So, But you don't see it as lost opportunity. But I love that. Like uh, Paul Tremblay, who wrote the knock at the cabin door, he's a twice Bram Stoker winner. He put that idea of the thought as a metaphor. Like if your dog keeps coming to you, and you don't play with that dog, you're a bad owner, but the dog is going to eventually stop coming to you. So when you have these thoughts and inspirations, write it down in the notebook, text yourself, record it in some way. Like me over there is doodling. Maybe his way of recording is to draw a picture. You know what I'm saying? So whatever works for you, capture the ideas. Even if it's a ridiculous thought, it may lead to something really powerful. You know what I'm saying? So don't disavow that. Don't, don't also too, he said something really important. You validate yourself. You have knowledge. You have the capacity to write. Don't ever doubt that. Go ahead, Gary. Um, I was just going to say from your comments that, uh, yeah, it's great to have children and to teach them all you know and then tell you to rebel against everything you've done and said. <laughs> Is that your advice? <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> That's because you're the ultimate rule breaker, brother. He breaks the rules all the time. All right, go ahead. Go and tell him who you um, Hi, I'm a student. My name is June. And um, sorry, the question sounds smoother in my head. Um, are you ever, so as an artist, there will always be a time that someone either doesn't understand your perspective or refuses to are you ever stopped by this fear that your perspective will be rejected like misael you write from a very um unique perspective you have your own uh struggles that you write from and then gary you said that one of the driving factors was um what was it what did he say one of your oh giving feedback. So are you ever do you ever feel stopped in your writing process by fear of rejection? And I don't think that fear ever goes away, but do you ever get stopped by the fear of rejection? Uh that's like asking a dam to stop because a breaking dam stops because there might be a stone in the way. Sorry, did you get that? So is that a no? I'm not sure if yes or no could be applied to this, but um, if you have something to say 
if there is momentum and energy behind it and you know it's good and it's worth saying and you must do it, then nothing should stop it. All right, good. So that was a no. Okay, thank you. Uh, Misael? Um, well, I would like to say that have you ever have you ever uh, sat with a friend and seen some something awkward happening in the relationship with your significant other and you notice details that to you seem that, that they seem kind of suspect and you ask yourself do I say something is it my place to say something like how much is, how much value is my friendship with this person well I hurt this person saying this thing so so you find yourself in a catch-22, like, am I a good person if I say this to my friend or am I a bad person because um, I, I'm ruining whatever's making them happy? Do I know if they will have time to to work their, their troubles out? You know, do I know that? Do I count that in? It all depends on your, your audience. You know, now, now that I mentioned this, I just want you to reflect that on... Um, in in life, we always associate um, our 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 actions with good and bad, right or wrong. But somebody once taught me there is no right or wrong. There is just only right or left. So you make a left. What do you do now? Do you keep going forward, or you make another right or left? And and that's that's how you got to work with when you're making your statements. Um, they seem like a good idea at the time. Um. And you have to be a very good judge of of what you do unto others. Do you want others to do that to you, or or things like that? You know, you have to respect. Um, you have to respect yourself uh, to say to voice certain things that you feel in your heart are true, and then there are other things in your heart that are that you will fight. You know, and I know I, you know, like. There is there is no right or wrong, just right or left. And I pray for all of you to make the best decisions that are good in your heart to make you grow and make you feel good about yourselves. And whether it be writing or sharing ideas, you must you must go through it. And then you learn. And later on, you evolve from it. Um, you might be uh, pro this or pro that or against this, against that. But later on, you reflect and you learn and you grow because you start evolving and you start seeing things differently so this is the moment for you to set the 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 base the the structure of your of your development so you got to start from somewhere to reach in your heart your deepest thoughts and and just go with it and as you evolve 20 years from now you'll see that you could you already have built your own structure on it thank you I love that because I teach my students to write to their own excellence, which is daunting. But each and every one of them has a unique view of the world. Each and every one of them has a unique writing style. And they just have to believe it. And nobody's going to believe it for you. That's the thing. You have to be secure within yourself. And it takes time and process, right? Go ahead. Um, hello, my name is Abby. I'm a student. And my question is if you guys struggle with writer's block and what you do to get out of it. That's a great question. I'll answer that too. Go ahead, Gary. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you for the question. Um, can you possibly remind me of it? Because I want for to sure, answer. for sure, and and I can give you a quick answer. The question was, do you experience writer's block, and when you do, how do you get over it? And I'm gonna tell you. I mean, I, I lean up. Look, I'm like, I get ideas from everywhere because you know I believe in cooperation. But um, the only time I ever got a writer's block was when I was working on a novel and I had revised it three times. And I literally hit a wall and my characters hit a wall. And so I did a lot of soul searching. I switched the main character. I made her a female. I switched the point of view and I still kept the other narrative. But when I did that, when I made the correct choice and I had a struggle with it, then I finished the book and now I've had it edited. I'm going to send it to a press that's interested. It doesn't mean they're going to take it. Um, but Paul Tremblay, who's got a creative writing friend who teaches in the Bronx, 
I'm sorry, I'm, I'm quoting Paul a lot because these questions come up repeatedly. The teacher said to him, and he's been teaching creative writing probably as long as I have, that you need to see these writer's blocks as opportunity. Like, it's fun. Here's a mystery. Figure it out. Sometimes it means you're making a mistake. And you got to sit back and think, all right, did I make a mistake in choosing this topic? Did I make a mistake in the direction the story is going in? But again, it's part of that adventure, part of that figuring out. So you got to kind of flip the narrative and not see the writer's block as something negative, as like you're deficient somehow, right? Don't think of it that way. Think of it as an opportunity to explore and figure out the answer. And then it's fun. It takes on a whole new meaning. You know what I'm saying? Plus, I'm, I'm, I'm that person that never gets writer's block. Like just that one time, I word bomb it a lot too, you know, but it's cause you know how I talk. I talk how I write like this. So I produce fast, but I've been thinking about it for so long beforehand that it's almost a finished product. Almost, not quite. Gary's read my drafts, but you know. All right, so that's my answer for you. Opportunities, see them as opportunities. Anytime anything negative comes upon you with your art, flip that narrative so you can produce because negativity is going to take you nowhere, right? All right, go ahead. That's enough proselytizing. And yo, we have like six minutes left. This has been beautiful. Thank you both. Go ahead. Well, thank you very much. Uh, but I agree, actually, with all you say. You know, if you have writer's block, then just go back and rewrite the whole thing from the heart and not from the brain. But we were actually talking about something else, and I had something to say, but I've totally forgotten that. Uh, Missile, can you remember? You know what I'm going to tell you is the advice I give myself, because you and I are close in age. I write it in the chat so I don't forget. And it's perfectly appropriate. Just saying. <laughs> oh, Go ahead, Misa. Right. You were uh, saying something from the heart, because, uh, Missile, so go for it. Well, well, me, uh, uh, because uh, I like I hear things that other people don't hear. Right, I establish that. I see things that other people don't see. And because of that, they, may, they label me uh, mentally ill. And um, I'm okay with it. I, I kind of have this pride about it, but um, I do know that when I when I hear a thought coming from a source other than me, I write it down. But I do know that my muses get hungry. My muses are fighting invisible things that other people can't see in order to get the thoughts uh, into my head. So with that said is. When someone is dealing with writer's block, they're listening to their muses, but their muses are not there. What do you do? So one thing that I do as a spiritual practice is I offer water or a mezcal to, to my shrine, my altar, for my grandfathers and my ancestors. And I tell my spirit guides, hey, you know what? Liberate these messages, whatever's going on through here, some, here's some empowerment so you get these thoughts down. And that works. And I feel like in this game of, of of the invisible scenarios, there's people that are really good at at being uh, whatever it is that we're supposed to do. They're really good at it. And I feel like when you're experiencing writer's block, is an attack. You're experiencing an attack and you don't know anything about it. You know something's wrong. You feel like shit. That's why people feel like shit when they have writer's block. They, they, they're just not getting... You're not tapped into that source. So part of it is empowering your muses. Um, reach out to them. Tell them, empower them, sing to them. Give them something that they could uh, energize themselves with. That way you can form a bridge to make sure that flow continues on. Like um, our brother said here, he said, um, uh, is yeah, you're going to stop, a, a, would a stone stop a dam from happening and or or, or the flow from happening? And that's pretty much what's going on with your muses being damned up. But, um, you know, you got to bomb it. You got to bomb those levees and make sure the water flows into your, through your hand into the writing paper. And um, I will pray for, I will pray for inspiration if you're experiencing writer's block. Um, I, I, I know I said something off the charts, but. I no, think no, you did it. In fact, that was perfect. Cause I, well, while you were answering the question, my thought was, He's talking about tapping into the source. Whether you believe in God or creativity or whatever, the source is the source, right? Um, and I'm just going to, maybe we're going to do accolades and thank our brothers here because this, this has been amazing, bro. You're on fire, Misa. So are you, Gary. This has been beautiful. 
what um oh shoot now i lost my train of thought hold up hold it i better come back to me inspiration grow beauty the source ah one of my favorite poets and he's not the only one because cynthia pelayo does it too uh tango eason martin who i have a crush on even though he just had a baby trader i just kidding you know, he knows it she's my uh honorary niece i'm making her baby blankets and all but what he does is that he meditates for about two hours a day just meditates but in meditating which it's not easy to do. He never, he's never lacking for material, right? And so there's something to be said. Like if you believe in the ancestors, I do. I offer them a fruit, piece of fruit, a little something every day, you know. Um, but I love that answer. That that was just beautiful. Hey, listen, this has been amazing. You have just done. A, I, I'm inspired. Are y'all inspired? Let's give him a huge round of applause. He had a, a sweet audience, and uh, we have already given away your book. Misael, I is this cool with you, brother? Do you mind if I give him a PDF of my spoken word wife? You're muted, brother. You're muted, brother. You're muted. You're still muted. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I, want, I, I would like, uh, if you give him a PDF of my work, I'm fine with it, but like, in exchange, I would like to ask for a, a review on 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 Goodreads or whatever it's called. And, okay, and... can you can you all handle that? They're saying yes that they will write a oh, review okay. for you. Oh, uh, yeah, that, then it's a fair exchange, I think. All right, thank <laughs> you. Appreciate that. And then uh, Gary, they have your book, so I'm sure Gary would also love a favorable review, um, an honest review. And listen, this has been so beautiful and inspiring. I was having a oh, I shouldn't let's not get too personal. You've elevated my spirits. You've elevated my artistry and my understanding of what it means to tap into the source. And thank you all for those thoughtful questions. That was beautiful. Because I think a lot of writers have that question, you know. Um, but thank you so much. Uh, just to remind you again, though, this evening at 6 o'clock, I'm going to have a Palestine and Israel Facts and Myths event on Zoom. I think you have the link. If you don't, email me or text me and I'll send it to you. I, I really will love it if you come just because it's such a hot topic and we need solidarity, you know, but thank you again. Let's give him another round of applause and thank you. I say this and I say it all the time. Think of Harold Washington as your second home. It is an honor, Gary. It's an honor, Messiah. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for responding to the call. The ancestors must have been with both of us today is all I got to say. Have an amazing day and I'll chat you up in a little bit. All right. Have an amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Much love. Thank you too. So much. And thank you to all you students. Mm -hmm. All right. Peace, brothers. Bye, everybody. Adios.